Hello, and welcome to Tarot Electric. I am Mary Shock. Thank you for being with me today on this second episode of the podcast. And the first thing that I want to do today is give you, the listener, a message through tarot. So I'm going to pull one card that's just for you listening right now. And this is going to be the guidance that you need to hear from the universe. I'm going to use the deck that I created, the Summer Tarot deck. And I'm going to give it a shuffle right now. And I'm going to ask for your greatest good and mine that I deliver messages from the universe that you need to hear in this present moment. Okay, we got the Emperor. So the Emperor is an interesting card and it seems very apt, especially because we are in Aries season and Aries is ruled by the Emperor or the Emperor rules Aries and the Emperor is a steady, and solid ruler. So I think that this is a time that you are being called to look at how you rule your life and also what rules you. The emperor asks you to look at your foundation, ground yourself in the earth, and find a solid, steady ground to stand on that you can build upon. The emperor is responsible for their own body, actions, environment, energy. And if you can control and be responsible for all of these things, and really they're the only things that are in our control, actually like our own body, our own energy, our own thoughts and actions, if we can control and be responsible for all of these things in a loving but firm way with ourselves, and we can let everyone else be their own emperors. So that means letting everyone else be the own master of themselves, their bodies, their energies, their thoughts and feelings. And this way we can all thrive independently and really stand on this earth strong and will support each other. But the emperor is very independent. So I think that at this time, we're really being called to focus on how we can be strong and independent as individuals and then later we come together as a community but right now it's about you it's about me it's about us as individuals and how we are taking care of our own responsibilities and I think we're really being called to question anyone who is going too far with this ruler energy and taking it into a place of the dictator I think we're really being called to like look at patriarchy with the emperor because it's all there. The emperor can be flexible, supportive, protective, safe, and strong, and that is the best emperor. And I think if we can embody those qualities, we'll inspire those around us to see that that's what makes a person truly powerful and truly in control to have responsibility for themselves and to let other people have responsibility for their own selves. 
that's real control because you let go of things that aren't actually in your control. So listening to this today, I would look at power in your life, look at what you need to be more firm, more in control of, more strong and steady and stable in your life. What boundaries can you put up that will serve you? And where can you let go of the need to overreach for control that is truly not yours? This is like putting up a protective bubble around ourself. And as empaths and sensitive people, it's actually our responsibility to maintain our own energy field. That means protecting ourselves, putting ourselves in a beautiful protective bubble that helps us regulate, set boundaries, and maintain a healthy energy field without letting outside forces affect our energy. It's our responsibility to protect our own energy and then to let other people keep up their own protection so we're not overstepping our bounds. So as sensitive people, a lot of times, and I fall into this, it can be easy to feel like, oh, I'm having a difficult time and other people's energy, they're messing with me. But in truth, it's our responsibility to put up psychic armor and shield ourselves so that we can go out in this world and do the work that we need to do, even if that's just being present in the day. The emperor takes no martyrs, no victims. The emperor looks for strength and solidity that we can build upon. So that's the guidance for today and I hope that is helpful to you. As always, take what resonates and just dump the rest. Many blessings on your emperor path. Now I would like to field some tarot frequently asked questions from my experience in teaching classes, doing readings, holding workshops, running the Be More Tarot Club, uh, tarot sharing circle. So because I've been able to do so much outreach and sharing tarot with the world, I've definitely have come up with questions that people have right away. And I would love to kind of dispel some of the tarot myths and share some of my perceived tarot truths. So The first and biggest myth you really just want to get out of the way is that tarot does not have such fantastical, mythical origins that it is often claimed to have. So you'll see in lots of like tarot uh, circles or uh, definitely depictions on TV and pop culture, uh, just all over the place, even in some books, the idea that tarot comes from Egypt, comes from Atlantis, comes from uh, gypsies, the Romani people, all kinds of stuff. The truth is Tarot originated in the Renaissance in southern Italy, Spain, and France. It was originally a game for gambling. It was a trick-taking game similar to bridge. So it's really important to dispel the myths about tarot's 
fantastical origins because it gives credit to the history of the true tarot, which is completely fascinating, and we could talk about that forever, basically. Um, and a lot of the tarot myths have come up out of misunderstandings, racism, and a general fear of magic. And I'd really like to bring the beauty and the art of tarot to light. So it's important to start there and kind of get those myths out of the way. And maybe I'll do a whole episode about my feelings about tarot's origins and also the true history of tarot because it is completely interesting coming out of um, the Christianity of the Renaissance. So there are a lot of Christian symbology in tarot, which is so interesting because it's been historically uh, demonized by the church and tarot also comes out of that southern Mediterranean so Europe and so you're looking at a period of time that maybe a hundred years before had a much looser communication between people of different religions so you're looking at a time when Christianity, Judaism, and Islam were all living together in the Mediterranean and a place where ideas between these religions could easily have been shared and explored. So maybe we'll get into that on its own one day. Next top tarot myth is that you cannot buy your own deck, that you have to be gifted a deck. And this leads to people not getting a tarot deck because they're waiting for someone to give it to them or feeling like they have to follow this rule. And it also leads to tarot decks being locked up in bookstores. So if you see tarot decks that are all behind a case and they're locked up that is exactly why because people will I mean it's a myth and maybe a common occurrence that people will steal tarot decks because you're supposed to be like gifted or steal a deck don't buy one yourself um I just like completely uh disagree with this concept because for me personally, some very important decks in my tarot history have been decks that I bought for myself. So I just completely don't believe that's true. And I think that it's a silly myth um, that just gets passed on and on. It's very nice to receive a deck as a gift, but I've also talked to many people that receive a deck from someone and it's their first deck and they got it as a gift but they don't resonate with it so I think that we can really let that myth go and give everyone their own personal power back in choosing and buying your own tarot deck go for it there's nothing wrong with it in fact with so many amazing new decks being created and so many decks available in print now it seems like an act of magic to choose which deck you resonate with because you can be looking at different artworks, going to your local uh, metaphysical bookstore and holding decks in your hand and feeling their energy. So you can really have a say in your tarot path and the tool that you're going to use. So. Don't believe the tarot myth that you have to be gifted a deck. I'd say go out, get a deck, try it, and um, if it doesn't completely 
sing to you, resonate in your heart and soul, don't be afraid to like try different decks. So I know this is kind of challenging because decks are often um, not inexpensive and we just can't be going out and buying all the decks we want, um, which I totally understand. So maybe you have friends that you can be trading decks with. In that way, you can help with some of the costs of having to buy different decks until you find the one that's like perfect for you and then there are also some Facebook groups and probably different online forums but I know that there's one on Facebook specifically for tarot trading so if you have decks that you're no longer vibing with like don't really need in your collection get onto Facebook and get on this tarot trading community and then you can trade you can give someone a deck that's no longer doing it for you and you might get something that really speaks to you. So some people have decks that they're like, this is my deck and this is the only deck I use. And um, that's a great way to go. I feel like those, I feel like those people are pretty lucky actually because they just feel it in their heart and they're like this is the only deck for me and this is it and I feel like we should all go searching for that perfect deck for us but if you're anything like me that you've probably found a couple different decks that all speak to you and they might speak to you at different times so for me personally I use the summer tarot deck which is the deck that I created and that's a majors only deck so it's only the major arcana cards 0 through 21 and I use that all the time I use it for myself I use it with clients I use it with friends it's very spiritual so I use it to look at big picture I use it to get messages from the universe when we're looking at the big stuff that's when I use the summer tarot deck then I also use a Marseille deck that's a Renaissance style deck and I use the print that was made by Hororowski I use that with myself with clients and that's kind of a zoom in looking for practical detail everyday guidance where the summer tarot deck does the big spiritual stuff the Marseille will zoom in and say okay but how can we get there what do we need to do today next week like what's actually happening and I'll use those two layer together and then recently in the past year I've been also using the Rider Waite Smith deck and I mean that's the most famous deck you probably have it in your collection and um and I started using that again, and I love it. It is so beautiful. I think that everyone should have this deck in your tarot collection. I really do. And I think that everyone should have a Renaissance-style deck also in their collection and try using it, the Marseille deck or something like it. But everyone should have the Rider Waite Smith. It is so beautiful and really speaks to me and it took a long time for me to get to a place where I can use it with other people and that's really just starting for me like this week you know like yesterday um, for a while this deck really was communicating to me that I needed to learn more about it I needed to further my studies I needed to use it for myself but not for other people but recently it's really been interested in reading for other people so that just tells you like how your decks are going to all speak to you at different times so maybe you've got one deck and that's a deck for you and you don't need anything else but if you're anything like me you've got a couple decks and you love them all and you use them maybe at different times with different vibes and they're going to shift and change so I just encourage everyone to experiment and listen to your heart when using your tarot decks and be open to a fluid and flexible relationship with them because our tarot decks, I mean, they're like our best friends and our counselors and a piece of our higher self and they have 
needs and they have missions. So I think we really need to listen to them. And then I have a couple like dream decks that are basically on my list, like a lot of indie decks, new decks that people have created that I want. And I don't exactly know how I would use them, probably mostly for my personal practice and to study and meditate with as art pieces. Recently, I got the Mother Peace deck, which is a classic deck, round, goddess, uh, centric and it is so beautiful and so amazing and that really speaks to me to use it personally to put it on an altar um, and to really study and speak to the pictures so I don't think that that's one that I'll be using for clients or for other people but we'll see that might change once I use it for a while we'll see what happens a great place to get decks is Okay, your local witchy shop, right? Definitely support those. And then also check out like Indiegogo and Kickstarter and Etsy because you can support indie artists that are publishing their decks. This is a tarot renaissance that we're going through. Tarot's trendy, okay, hot topic. Like maybe we're going to have to talk about that on its own thing too because Tarot is super trendy to the point of possibly like commercialization, which is not what those of us that love and use tarot as a spiritual tool, we're not looking for tarot to be commodified, but um, I really do support in general the rebirth of tarot recently and how excited people are getting about it and how many more people I see being excited and getting into tarot because when I first got into tarot as a very young person it was really not available in the same way there would be a couple books at the witchy bookstore but there weren't classes there weren't workshops and it just wasn't happening in the same way there wasn't such an online community that I could really identify with so I'm really grateful and I think it's amazing that tarot is blowing up right now. I think in a hundred years it'll just be commonplace. Have a tarot deck in your house, like of course you'll have a tarot deck in your home. You'll use it to speak to your inner voice, you'll use it for guidance, you'll understand the symbology. That is my belief about the future and also my hope and my wish because I think it would be a good world if we were all living in connection to our inner voice and our highest self. I'd like to share with you all the story of my very first tarot deck, my first Rider Waite Smith deck, and how that really affected my tarot story and my life. So I first got the deck for Christmas as a present from my mother when I was, I believe, like 12 years old. Um, it is hard to say for sure. And I asked my mom why she gave me the deck, and she said, well, Mary, you've always been interested in the occult. And I said, oh, okay, that's interesting, because I grew up in this very Catholic family, went to Catholic school from kindergarten to eighth grade, so I'm coming from this background, but my parents were very supportive and my mom just let me do very witchy things. So there are pictures of me at my ninth birthday party and I had like a fortune teller themed party. We strung necklaces of Fruit Loops. I remember I got a ribbon dancer and my aunt read tarot cards. My grandmother was in the basement with a crystal ball giving us fortunes. And I remember going to the basement and it was so magical and getting this like fortune telling from my grandma. And it was amazing. And then I remember, and I believe this was later at a cousin's pool summer birthday party, my aunt Jane, who I love, 
giving tarot readings to all of us kids next to the pool. And I remember getting this tarot reading and I just loved it. I was super into it. And I think that that is probably what encouraged my mom to get me a deck, but she doesn't really remember. And I remember when my Aunt Jane was reading my cards, she said something about my mom, right? She's like, well, this card is a woman, so it might have something to do with your mom. And how are you feeling about your mom today? And I always felt like this was probably a queen, maybe a queen of cups, um, maybe the high priestess or the empress. You know, I was always trying to remember and like figure out what this card was, but who, it was always like, who really knows? Probably a queen was my best guess. So then I'm about 12, we think my mom gives me a Rider Waite Smith deck and a book. And I think I was super into it. I thought it was really cool. I do remember another family member saying to me that it was not a part of her religion to read tarot cards, but she thought it was nice anyway that I was excited. And this person was actually not... Catholic, um, but I definitely remember that, and I think I was a little bit affected by it or hadn't really thought about tarot cards and magic things being anti Catholic or against anyone's religion, but that kind of put that in my mind. And I don't know if it was because of that conversation or just because tarot cards were complicated for me at 12, but I don't remember using them a whole lot. I think I just had them. I probably played with them like for January and then kind of forgot about them after, after the newness wore off from receiving them for Christmas. But I had this Rider Waite Smith deck and then I didn't really use it that much. It was in a closet or a bookshelf or something at home. Then on my last day of high school, I actually took another deck of fortune telling cards that my mother had given me to school and I was reading people's fortunes on my last day of my senior year of high school. And this was, a, they call it a gypsy fortune telling card deck. Um, it's 52 cards and then they all have little pictures and like sayings about what they mean and there was a little white book. So I'm reading people's spreads and I'm putting the cards where they say to put them and I have pictures of me like waving my hands around while I'm giving people these readings and I remember people saying that the readings made sense to them. I really remember that. Um, and I was just like, oh, this is cool. This is really cool. And I think that encouraged me to get my tarot deck back out again and start playing with it. And then it was after high school um, and like when I was 18, 19, 20, that I started to get really into tarot. And I had a friend who would read with me. So we would stay up and read each other's tarot cards. We would hang out and read tarot cards for our other friends and we were just studying and getting really into it and I loved it. I was using this Rider Waite Smith deck and it was amazing. I was super into it, got really good feedback from other people, very, very interested in loving it. So then I went to California and I stayed there for several months and I brought my tarot deck with me. Um, now, when I was there, I also had a little bit of a mental breakdown. I lost my tarot cards when I came back to Baltimore. And I was really, really sad about it. And we could never find them. And I lost this deck that I had been gifted when I was 12 years old and I was really really sad about it. Now it took me a while but eventually I don't know if it was a couple months or a year 
I got another tarot deck and it was really just all part of my tarot journey. So it's sad that I lost that original deck, but I've been able to reconnect with the Rider Waite Smith in the past year, studying it and using it, which has been really fun and really speaking to my soul and my heart. So it is all for the best. I've also been able to reconnect with the deck that gave me my first tarot reading. So my aunt brought the deck out and gave me a tarot reading from this original deck that she had read my cards with by the pool at my cousin's birthday party when I was maybe 10 years old. And this deck is an Aquarian deck, which is very interesting. And um, when my aunt tells me, oh, I'll, sh I'll get the original deck that I use. And she goes upstairs to get the deck. And I started to think, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if I could ask this deck what that original card was that my aunt pulled when she was talking about my mother. So I wonder if I could figure out what that card was. And, um, my aunt brings the deck down and I hold it in my hands and it has a good intense energy and I flip it over and there's the queen of wands and I have a knowing in my heart and I'm like, that's it. It was the queen of wands. That was the card that spoke to me that I've been thinking about. Maybe she's been lighting a fire underneath me ever since like moving me forward and inspiring me creatively and holding the tarot torch for me. There's a history in my family of mothers gifting daughters tarot decks. My grandma gave my aunt her first deck, the deck that I got my first reading with. And later when I ask my grandma, why did you do that? Because my grandma does not believe in tarot. She says, oh, I just thought she would like it. It spoke to her. And my mother gave me a deck, not knowing how important it would be to me. The tarot would become my whole world. So I'm feeling really grateful for all the women in my life, the matriarchs and everyone in my tarot history. And I'm grateful for tarot, grateful for the queen of wands. And I'm grateful for you for listening to this podcast. Many blessings. Check me out on Instagram. If you want to be friends at tarot electric, visit my website, www.maryshock, that's S-H-O-C-K, dot com. If you want to chat, find events, get a tarot reading, thanks for listening, and blessed be.